Hi, this is uh, Shyam Vardarajulu from Orlando Health Center for Advanced Endoscopy Research and Education. Welcome to the webinar that we are hosting on the role of state-of-the-art endoscopic technologies in the practice of interventional endoscopy. Fluoroscopic technology is critical, second only in importance to an endoscope to the practice of therapeutic endoscopy. In this live webinar, we will be teaching you about how to integrate the Omega Imaging AI platform in the practice of interventional endoscopy and we will be demonstrating two live procedures showcasing this, in, uh, this fluoroscopic technology in our practice. I hope that you will find this webinar to be of relevance and importance to your clinical practice. I will now turn this over to my colleague Dr. Robert Haas. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to, uh, to welcome you to uh, our Center for Advanced Endoscopy Research and Education. And uh, we have a, a little bit of a unique program uh, for you today. We are going to be doing procedures to, to show you some uh, endoscopic techniques. But the, the main purpose of this uh, program is actually to educate you on uh, what is now state-of-the-art uh, endoscopy interventional suites. Uh, unfortunately, I'm old enough uh, to have experienced um, the beginning uh, of interventional ERCP and the beginning of the integration of endoscopy with fluoroscopy. Uh, and when I began, uh, as many others did, uh, we had to wait uh, until radiology was done with their, uh, uh, with their radiology suites. Uh, usually the barium suite was the one that, uh, uh, that we got. Uh, they'd call us up, uh, usually late in the afternoon. We'd uh, truck our equipment down to the radiology department. Uh, we would sedate the patient ourselves. We would uh, generate the images. We would then have to, um, uh, to expose uh, the radiographs, look at them. And it was a very tedious and, and difficult uh, kind of a situation. As ERCP progressed, uh, we got more and more um, access, if you will, to the radiology suite, but still we were entering a, uh, an area that was controlled by a different discipline. We then, uh, the further advancement was we began using uh, radiology equipment that was primarily used in uh, interventional cardiology. And so the high volume centers uh, could afford to buy uh, fluoroscopy equipment to have it uh, access to it in their own rooms, but it was not purpose built for, uh, for ERCP and for other interventions. And we've now progressed to the point where uh, we now uh, have the volume uh, and we have the interest in companies to make purpose built fluoroscopy equipment. So I want to take you through uh, first uh, the fluoroscopy equipment, uh, the Omega fluoroscopy equipment that we use, and then introduce you a little bit to the, um, uh, to the interventional suite uh, in general. So uh, this is the Omega uh, fixed C-arm fixed table uh, system. It is purpose built for, uh, for ERCP and for other interventions. Uh, it's been designed in cooperation with endoscopists. Uh, uh, and so the, the, the key features, some of the key features that I want to show you uh, is number one, uh, the table. Uh, this is a 30 inch wide table uh, with an 800 pound uh, weight capacity. Uh, so all of us uh, in endoscopy are dealing more and more with uh, overweight and morbidly obese patients. Uh, and this table is wide, secure, and can handle uh, these additional weights. Uh, we have a, a, a fixed C-arm, but unlike um, other uh, systems, this C-arm will uh, rotate away. A and uh, the footprint... Uh, in the endoscopy suite uh, is opened up by uh, moving this aside. Also, uh, if you'll follow me, if we need access to this side of the patient, uh, if they need to be flipped, moved, if we have a, an acute situation, 
we can move this aside and we have full access uh, to this side of the patient, uh, which is really important. Uh, we'll move this back around now. And I want to, I think uh, one of the things that Omega has done uh, is uh, really concentrate on safety. Um, again, uh, for people my age, uh, some of us are coming up with uh, probably radiation-induced uh, issues, uh, thyroid uh, and other issues. But here we have complete 360-degree screening for, for scatter, both uh, in, in this part of the machine, but also on the table. So we have done a study uh, that has shown an 84% reduction in exposure to scattered radiation when the Omega system is compared to a regular C-arm. So uh, an important uh, safety feature uh, that is there. The physician has full control uh, in our unit. Uh, the table movement and the movement of the, uh, the C-arm are controlled by a radi radiation tech. Uh, but if the um, physician wants to control it, this control panel hooks to here and you can control uh, the table yourself. So uh, it's uh, sort of as you wish. We happen to do integration uh, with a, a company called Steris. Uh, so they've done both the booms uh, and the integration system, but Omega offers those services uh, as well. And I think when you, uh, when you combine with Omega, uh, they are a, a good partner who are sensitive to the radiology needs of, uh, of endoscopists. And then finally, I want to show you, uh, I'll push this aside, but you can get uh, an option of a fixed C-arm, as you hold here, but a mobile table. So this allows you to, uh, to move the table in and out uh, of the room, uh, depending on, on how you want to use it. So this increases flexibility. So... Um, this is sort of a keyword uh, for me for uh, the state-of-the-art interventional suites is the term flexibility. Uh, and so I want to show you the features of this room that lend to flexibility. I think first it starts with these booms. Uh, so the booms control the, the monitors. So these monitors can be moved all around so that the observation uh, for the endoscopy, fluoroscopy, whatever uh, you need to be viewing can be set up in a comfortable uh, uh, way for you as you're doing uh, the procedure. The other thing that the booms do is they keep everything off of the floor and uh, wire connections and so forth can be uh, disrupted uh, during cleaning processes and so forth but the booms allow uh, everything to stay off of the floor. We have integrated in this suite, uh, we have uh, uh, opportunity to do cholangioscopy, we have opportunity to do uh, single-use uh, uh, ERCP scopes, we have obviously uh, all the equipment for doing standard endoscopy, uh, we have endoscopic ultrasound uh, available uh, in this suite. And then all of the inputs uh, that you have, uh, be it uh, spyglass, uh, the endoscopy, endoscopic ultrasound, fluoroscopy, uh, whatever input you have, you can integrate anywhere onto these, uh, these panels. And then finally, I think somebody uh, or a group, I should say, that don't get enough um, sort of credit uh, and enough planning is anesthesiology uh, and anesthesia. So uh, we do all of our procedures under anesthesia. And so it's important that you design uh, your room uh, so that number one, you have enough room but also that the uh, anesthesiologist uh, provider 
uh, is, uh, has all the equipment they, they need. You can see here that their equipment is all on a boom, uh, and they have good access to the patient. Uh, they have plenty of room uh, for all their equipment, uh, etc. So uh, this is uh, what we feel is uh, the state-of-the-art, flexible, integrated, purpose-built, uh, uh, interventional uh, endoscopy room uh, with a focus uh, today on the, on the fluoroscopy, uh, which is now uh, finally uh, purpose designed for our uses, uh, which is really important. So with that, I'll close uh, this section uh, of, the, um, uh, of the program. And I'm going to be moving now to uh, another room, uh, and I'll be uh, doing a case, and that case will be uh, presented by my partner, Dr. Ji Young Bang. So thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, we are going to be going to the live procedures now. Uh, welcome to our webinar. So our first patient is um, a patient with uh, multiple extra and intrahepatic bile stones who presents for follow-up after a biliary sphincterotomy, uh, stone extraction and um, a 10 French 18 centimeter plastic stent was left duct uh, and the patient presents for follow-up. Um, as you can see the patient has um, intrahepatic bile duct stones that uh, needs to be uh, removed. Uh, next slide. Uh, we published a study which showed that using artificial intelligence to reduce uh, radiation at fluoroscopy guided endoscopic procedures. And in this study, we used um, artificial intelligence to um, focus the radiation um, into the area of the field uh, of, um, of need rather than it being widespread throughout the entire um, entire uh, area of radiation exposure and we found that there was a 84% reduction in radiation exposure to both the patient um, and the staff. And the learning objective for this procedure is going to be to demonstrate the features of FluoroShield in minimizing radiation exposure and to discuss the need for advanced techniques for management of intrahepatic stones. We're now going to the procedure room with uh, Dr. Hawes. All right, so... Um... I'm just getting started here on this case. Uh, you can see here, actually, there's a little bit of narrowing here in the apex of the duodenal bulb. Uh, hopefully, we're going to be able to get through that. And yes, we were able to get through that. So here is the previously placed stent. Um, I generally extract these with a, with a snare. I encourage you, uh, before you remove the snare, that you always sort of take a look at the uh, ampullary anatomy. Sometimes you can get some bleeding uh, and it can obscure the anatomy and it'll help if you open, if you uh, take a look at that anatomy and sort of familiarize yourself with it. Close. Uh, uh, open just a little bit. Close. Uh, all right, so we've got that closed. I'm going to pull back here a little bit. Uh, you, you sort of want to gently remove it. I don't like to jerk. Uh, and then what I generally do is, is torque right and push in to sort of augment the removal of the stent, uh, sort of like you're extracting a stone almost. Uh, but again, you don't want to sort of jerk this and, and do it in, sort of in a, in a violent way, which is uh, what uh, just happened. So this just broke off, and maybe we'll be able to still capture it. Okay, open. Okay, close. Let's try that again. Uh, I can fluoro here, and it sort of hooked around that uh, upper part, I think, but hopefully it'll come out. Hmm. So it's a little bit tight up there, and... Uh, 
So it'll be interesting to, to see what's there. So um, what I've chosen now is a, a, a curved guide wire that's torqueable. Uh, the one I've chosen is the, the VisiGlide uh, and a stone extraction balloon. And what I want to do uh, as the first part of uh, this evaluation is a, a gentleman with intrahepatic stones. <laughs> and so um, I basically want uh, the maximum amount of uh, access to the intrahepatic ducts. And at least in my view, uh, that occurs with a torqueable curved wire. <coughs> okay, so we'll fluoro. And now I'm going to ask Max to, to just flip it, and I'm actually hoping to go uh, <coughs> to the right side. This is so that's okay, that's not exactly where I wanted to go, but let's uh, do a little bit of contrast injection. <clears throat> okay, and while we're here, let's do a sweep. So we're going to inflate the balloon, and I'm just going to do a little bit of a sweep. Okay, floral. The max is obviously advancing that wire uh, to keep it there. I didn't get much out of anything, so I'm gonna now he's gonna let me back in. Floral. And now we're gonna try for another for another branch. Okay. So I'm, this is basically a process um, <clears throat> of me varying, excellent, varying uh, the end of the of my catheter and giving uh, the technician enough uh, room to to torque the wire. Now, once he's in a branch, uh, I've got to get around a relatively acute angle there. So you want to get uh, the wire in as far as possible so that you're going around the bend in the stiffest part of the wire, or at least as stiff as you can get it. So I'm going to fluoro, and Max is going to let me in, and hopefully I'll be able to get around this corner here. Okay, so I'm going up straight, which I think is okay. Uh, so we're going to pull back Max a little bit. And we're going to take a look at this segment as well. So balloon up. And I'm going to do a sweep here and inject a little bit. Just a little bit. That's it. Okay. So I'm going to sweep. Okay. So pull back. Try it again. Okay. Well, right, that's good. No, no. Take it. Can you get in further, though? That's it. Okay. So now he's got, let the balloon down. He's gone in as far as he can. I'll try to make this curve. Dr. Hawes, um, yeah. someone's asking if you know how long the stent has been in there, just with the way it kind of broke apart when you pulled it out. Has it been uh, in there for a long time? Yeah, it's a, a good question. I think it's only been in for uh, maybe a couple months. A couple of months. Yeah, okay. so okay. we're still not into that segment, are we, Max? Okay. The balloon up again. And maybe hyperinflate it just a little bit this time. So with these balloons, you can, uh, it's an eight and a half balloon, but you can hyperinflate it. Uh, they tolerate that well just uh, to do an extra sweep here and make sure that, that, that everything is gone. So, um, okay. Okay, so pull Max. Pull, try to... So Max is pulling now, trying to, I'm trying to get around this fairly acute bend, and it's not happening too much. And you can see here that 
that the wire flips into a straight segment because I'm not operating over a very stiff part of this wire. Uh, and that's the, the problem. This is an 025 wire, uh, so that's, again, part of the problem. Okay. So there we, we got around that corner now. So uh, I think that was a <coughs> partly Max doing some, some good uh, pulling and me keeping the, um, the angle a little bit less acute. So go ahead and, and, and inject. Okay, so I don't see anything there. So the balloon up, but keep the wire there. So we're going to, again, do a sweep of this segment. Okay. And now let the balloon down. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to ask uh, Leo to, uh, uh, whenever you're looking in the intrahepatics, uh, obviously it's a 2D uh, rendition of what's going on, but you should utilize the capacity of the C-arm. So I've, I've seen uh, a bunch of the biliary tree from this particular projection, but let's go ahead and, and inject a little bit, and please move the projection if you can, Leo, and let's get a different projection on these intrapatic ducts. Injecting just a little bit. And you can, as you do that, okay, stop. Take a picture there. And as you do that, as he moves, you can determine whether the ducts are being separated, i.e. You, you have less overlap, or whether you now have more overlap of the ducts that you want to see. So, uh, Max, let me pull back a little bit now. And now I want you to inflate the balloon. And now I want you to inject uh, gently, not, not very much. Okay. Take a picture there, Leo. Okay, so now I want you to uh, change the projection again, Leo. Okay, and take a picture there. Okay. And now change the projection some more. Excellent. So take a picture there. Inject just a little bit more now, Max. Now I'm going to have Max inject just a little bit. Picture there. Okay. So I'm... So I'm pretty comfortable with the, with the branch that, that Max is in right now, and I'm sort of interested in these ducks that are all off to the left. So I'm going to ask Max to pull back, and I'm going to ask him to try to, to, uh, to find those ducks on the, on the other side. If you want to let the balloon down, that would be all right. So I'll let the balloon down, and that may... No? Okay. So I backed off a little bit to give uh, Max more room uh, to manipulate the wire. And so he's done a great... Ooh, whoa, whoa. So there's a, a good example. Now he's got to let me in. Uh, and if he lets me in, then that will stiffen uh, the system and then allow him to, to push. Okay, so now we're in that segment. Now he can push uh, a lot more sort of strongly, if you will, or with more vigor. Now I've gone around that turn, so let's uh, go ahead and uh, inflate the balloon, and I'm going to do a sweep here. But Horst, do you have a strategy for making sure all the stones are removed from all the intrahepatic branches? Yeah, so uh, I think it's just a matter uh, of what I'm doing, uh, G. So uh, I'm... I'm just selecting segments. Ah, look, oh, endoscopically. You yeah. see that? Yeah. Okay, so we've, we've <laughs> had some success here. <laughs> it's very difficult to see on the floor image, the, uh, the look little at that. stones. Yeah. Oh, very nice. So I think that's a really good point. These are difficult to see on fluoroscopy. Uh, they're sort of soft and so forth, uh, but uh, we made some progress here. Okay, let me back in. Okay, and let's do a, a, a balloon up at a, a hyperinflate the balloon. I think that maybe the stones that I removed 
maybe came from that uh, duck that was coming off to the right. So uh, that's why I'm just doing some extra sweeping of the of the common duck. Okay. Let it down. Okay. So Max, can you find any other segment on that side? So come back to the tip of the catheter. And uh, just find another segment if you can. That's all right. If it'll go someplace. Yeah. I, oh. Is that the same segment? Probably the same segment. Okay. Inject some contrast. Let's change the projection there just a little bit. A little bit more. Okay. All right. Put the wire in. Is that going to go anywhere? Yeah. All right. All right. So whenever you see the wire buckle over with a decent diameter of the buckle, you know that you're in a decent segment. So I'm going to pursue this uh, for sure. Go as far as I can, and then go ahead and inflate the balloon. Okay. So Max is advancing the wire to maintain access to that. Whenever I, I don't like to pull on the balloon really hard, what I prefer to do is put some tension on the balloon and then push the scope in. I think, to me, it's a more controlled way to, uh, to get the balloon down. Okay, Max. So now increase the... So we're just increasing the size of the balloon now. Now I'm going to pull it back. Mm, and look at that. Second. We got some more... Ah, look, oh, look. Wow, this is a lot. Excellent. Excellent yield, Max. Okay, <laughs> so we're going to go back up there and do this segment again now. Again, you can see that I'm using a fair amount of fluoroscopy, which is necessary. So we're happy that we're, we're shielded here and that we have a system that, that minimizes our exposure. So now balloon up again. But do you worry about the fact that maybe there are some small areas of stricturing in the hyla region? And that's why you're having difficulty getting the right. So, out of those uh, areas? you mean obviously, I uh, in these kind of situations, you you know, it's impossible to know or to clear every single little branch. So, uh, I think that um, okay. So, inject now, man. So. Uh, sure, uh, I I uh, I can't access everything. Okay, so can you change the angle again for me? Good, keep on going. Sorry, is the balloon up? Sorry, just saying. Blue up now. Okay. So let's do one more sweep here. Okay. Come down. Okay, so um okay, pull back Max. Again, I, I can't do everything here. I think we've done a, a fair amount of work going on. And so uh, what I'm going to do now, if, if people have time, you're welcome to, to stay with me or, or move to, to v, v. But I'm going to do spyglass now and just take a look at as much of the biliary tree as I can. Yeah. 
And the purpose of spyglass is, number one, to look to see if there's any obvious stones, but also to flush. So some of these uh, soft little fragments, I may be able to flush out with the... So what we'll do, Dr. Horse, is go to Dr. V while he does a ERCP, and then we'll come back to you in a few minutes while you get the spyglass inserted. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, welcome to our second case. Uh, this is a 54-year-old patient with abdominal pain who has a 7-centimeter pseudocyst in the tail region of the pancreas on CT scan. The patient has severe abdominal pain but is afebrile with a normal white cell count. And we are going to be performing an ERCP to assess for pancreatic duct leak. And then we'll be performing an endoscopic ultrasound with possible drainage of the pancreatic fluid collection. Next slide. So this is a study that was published by our group. It's the Orlando Protocol for Managing Pancreatic Fluid Collections. And in this study, we found that in patients with pseudocysts who do not have a uh, ductal uh, obstruction, uh, then aluminum piece metal stent can be placed. In patients with pancreatic pseudocysts, but with um, a ductal obstruction, either from a stricture or stone, uh, we'll need to have plastic stents placed transmurally, uh, which can stay in indefinitely. Next slide. So the learning objective of this case is to demonstrate the fluoroscopic imaging capability of the Omega eView artificial intelligence in the assessment of ductal anatomy, and also look at the evidence-based management of the pancreatic fluid collection as outlined in the Orlando Protocol. We're now getting ready to go to the procedure with Dr. Varadara Jilu. Thank you. What I'm trying to do is to cannulate the pancreatic duct in this patient. And the reason is the patient has got a fluid collection on the tail that needs to be decompressed. If I can get a pancreatogram and if the duct is uniformly patent, then I will treat this patient with a metal stent, which is uh, axios. And this axios will be removed after three to four weeks. But if the duct is blocked, then this patient will require a permanent treatment of the stone or stricture. And if he can't do that, we should manage it with plastic stents so that we will have a permanent inwelling tract. So I'm using an exalt uh, single-use duodenoscope. I've got a clever cut sphincterotome with a 0 to 5 inch Visiglide wire. So here's a wire. We're going to try a wire-guided cannulation. I'm, I'm going to aim for the pancreas. So I'm now at around 4 o'clock position in the papilla. And once I have positioned my wire, Max will now try to gain access into the pancreatic duct. Fluoro. Max is now going to anchor me a little bit. And it looks like we are just bouncing off. So I'm trying to anchor and Max's wire, I think as I'm fairly sure, he's in the pancreas. He's now going to inject a tinge of contrast. And that is contrast. And we can see that the pancreatic duct looks reasonably good. So Max is now going to navigate the wire to the tail of the pancreas. And I'm going to just let him flip the wire to the tail. And what we are trying to do is to see if there is a leak in the tail. And you can see the box. That is the AI box from Omega that re- reduces radiation scatter. So I'm not going to follow Max. He's going through a side branch. So he's now tr- trying to avoid the side branch and navigate himself to the tail to see if there's a leak. So I can either push the scope, slightly change the position to help Max go to the tail of the pancreas. I think he has navigated the first branch and he's almost at the tail. I'm not going to follow him. And he's going to pull me in, pull me in max. And then we are going to, we are at the neck. And sometimes that can be challenging. So I'm going to change the configuration of my duodenoscope a little bit to help me make the turn. And now I am past the turn. I'm going to straighten my duodenoscope a little bit. I'm pulling it towards me. And then I think this is a reasonably good position. Max, can we inject some more contrast to see if there's any leak in the tail? And we don't see anything in the tail of the pancreas picture. So there's no reason to do anything anymore in this patient. But as you can see, I have opacified this with adequate contrast. I don't want to cause post-ERCP pancreatitis. So we are going to place your four French, maybe an eight or a nine centimeter pancreatic stent. 
Uh, it'll be a single pigtail stent with no flange. So let's go with a wire, fluoro please. So I'm going to advance the wire a little bit more. And you can see that when I move my scope a little bit, Max is able to advance this wire without a problem. So we are now going to perform an exchange and place a prophylactic pancreatic stent. So this patient can be treated with a luminoposing metal stent that will be left indwelling. And when the patient comes back to see me in about a month, I will remove the luminoposing stent and I will not exchange it for a plastic stent because the pancreas pancreatic parenchyma looks fairly preserved for the most part. All right, Max. So this is a, a, a very common in our practice that we will administer intermethacin for all our patients. And in addition to it, since we have put a fair uh, amount of contrast into the pancreas, that we will place in a prophylactic stent. Uh, we make sure the flanges are cut. There's a single pigtail at the end. The stent will stay in situ for, uh, for about three weeks. Since this patient will come for a follow-up endoscopy to remove the luminoposing metal stent, I will not do an x-ray. Otherwise, these patients will get an x-ray in about three weeks to make sure the stent has spontaneously migrated. So pending the placement of the stent. I, that's exactly what I will do. I'm going to place the stent and I will perform an endoscopic ultrasound to assess if the collection is good for drainage and if it is conducive, I will go ahead and, uh, and, and place a luminoposing metal stent. And depending on the amount of debris, it will be a 15 or a 20 millimeter stent. These days we tend to place 20 in most patients unless we are draining a clear uh, fluid collection such as a pseudocyst. So, this uh, particular stent that we use does not have your external mark. So, Max has placed a mark on the stent so that we can visualize the mark as we pass it uh, through the duodenum. So, I don't think uh, we, we have performed any dilution on this contrast. Uh, this is just undiluted contrast. Pull me in. Right, Max? We don't dilute our contrast. Not on this one. Um, so I'm just going to push myself a little bit because we have not done a pancreatic sphincterotomy. I'm advancing and Max is pulling the wire as I am passing my stent. That is the external mark. I'm going to push the stent. I'm looking down on my up down and I'm just releasing the stent in the duodenum. So I know I have felt it and Max is now going to pull the wire back and this will conclude uh, the ERCP part of this procedure. So uh, this patient has a normal pancreas with a prophylactic stent being placed and then we will proceed to drainage of the fluid collection. So you can come back to us with yes. the EUS. Yes, we're going to go to Dr. Horse now and then um, so we can watch the uh, spyglass of the stones and then we'll come back for the endoscopic ultrasound part, Dr. V. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, you should be seeing the spyglass image. Uh, you can see fluoroscopy and spyglass. Uh, the endoscopic image is not important. But you can see here, I just been, while you've been away with Dr. V, I've just been exploring side branches uh, in the intrapatics. If you go ahead and, and um, uh, do fluoro for just one second, you can see that I'm up in, uh, in one of the branches I've, and I've encountered this stone. So uh, uh, I have an EHL probe, and I'm just going to, to break this stone up, and then I'm going to rely on flushing uh, for it to, to come out. I like to use, uh, with, with EHL, I like to use high power and just individual uh, uh, pulses. So I don't like to use the machine gun approach. I just uh, use a single... Uh, pulse, but at high at a high rate. And now I've opened it up. There's no point in uh, like that fragment 
uh, that you see right there is like one millimeter, uh, and it just sort of bounces away. So uh, there's only so much you can do with this, and you rely on flushing. So there I'm, I'm flushing into a closed space, and that drives these fragments uh, out. So now I've gone to that segment, and now we're just going to explore a few more segments here. Do a, a fair amount of flushing. So there's a segment up there. I'm sorry? Well, not really. I mean, in reality, these are, you know, sort of one okay. millimeter little fragments sure. and so forth. And uh, so they tend to get suspended in, uh, in this uh, sort of mucus and so forth. But I'm just going to flush these as I, and I back off. And uh, someone in the audience wants to know whether you um, inserted the spy scope freehand or whether you inserted over a, a guide right. wire. What's your so uh, I, I prefer to uh, go freehand uh, because I think it's easier and more efficient and, and so forth. This person had a sphincterotomy a long time ago, so everything was was, uh, you know, sort of open and, and so forth. Um, if you've just done a fresh sphincterotomy uh, and there's any thought that uh, you'll have difficulty getting into the bile duct, then I would prefer that you go over a wire. But if you've got a big, wide open sphincterotomy and you're very comfortable with it, I would recommend uh, just doing um, uh, freehand. But a fresh sphincterotomy, if you, if you don't cannulate uh, easily, you can actually get, um, uh, you can uh, sort of dig into the submucosa and you actually get a confined perforation mm -hmm. if you're digging around too much. So yeah. be a little bit careful. Again, I, you, you can't remove these fragments. Every single, little single fragment you can't remove, but they're, they're uh, I just, I flush them away. I go into each uh, sort of little segment that I can see. I periodically go to fluoro, so we can go to fluoro and sort of see where you are. And so I've come way back now, and now I'll just explore this uh, limb here. And you can see here that probably harbored a stone. Come back. There's one down there, but I can't really get into that, but I'll flush into it. And maybe sometimes little fragments will come out. Come back. I'm just looking for side branches. I'm looking for any branch anywhere that I can go into. There's a branch that, uh, you know, was sort of inflamed and so forth. So I'm just going to... That almost looked like there might have been a little pus in that one, do you think? Dr. Bang? Yeah. I don't know, maybe. I think so. And yeah. so, Dr. Horse, you know, I know you're, you can't remove 100% of all the stones that are inside the, all the intrahepatic branches. So, you follow these patients up and um, you just repeat an ELCP or you just let them be. And if they have any symptoms, you bring them back as needed. What is your strategy in this yeah. sort of situation? So uh, I have no data to back this up, but uh, for people with uh, recurrent stones and cholangitis, uh, yes, uh, I will do a, a what I call a prophylactic uh, ERCP, uh, in which I'll bring them back usually at about uh, two or three months after I think that I've cleared them out, and I'll just repeat the ERCP and sweep and, and uh, do everything I can to, to, to remove things. I don't have any data to suggest that that reduces the <laughs> incidence of recurrent stones. This is, uh, a I, I think, a case not so much of recurrent stones, but just uh, intrahepatic stones that, that probably haven't been fully cleared. <laughs> Excuse me. Laurel? 
Okay. So, <coughs> just continuing to, to come back here a little bit. I will probably, before I'm done, uh, Dr. Bang, I will probably uh, uh, at least sweep the main uh, bile duct, mm -hmm. not, not all, do all the branches again, but yes. the main duct. Okay, fluoro? Okay, so now I'm going in, I think a little bit to the right, maybe. So here's a duct that I'm not sure I've been in. Okay, so there's some fragments, but again, I, I can't remove all those. Now there's a branch, I think, up at the 2 o'clock position. Let me see if I can get into that one. Plural? Okay. So this is the problem, uh, you know, sort of to get centered when it's a big turn like that. This is the problem with pancreatoscopy. If there's bends and curves, the, the angle of this scope is not such that you can keep a, a centered uh, view all the time. But I'm getting a decent view here, and I'm pretty happy with this segment. I don't see a lot of grunge or anything coming out, and I've now had an opportunity to flush it, uh, so that's good. And will you be leaving a biliary stent uh, at the end of the procedure? Yeah, no. So stents are lithogenic, uh, Dr. Bang. So if if I don't think I've cleared it, if I think that there's going to be a stone impacting the bile duct or something like that, I would leave a stent. But just to leave a stent uh, here, these are all one millimeter fragments. Uh, they won't obstruct the bile duct, but the stent will serve as a, as a, a nidus for stone formation. So I, I would encourage you not to leave a stent behind. Okay, fantastic, Dr. Hawes. Thank you so much for this okay. wonderful demonstration. We're gonna go back now to Dr. V, okay. who's ready with his endoscopic So just for everybody to say, I'm gonna go ahead and blast this one because oh, it's sort okay. of, uh, we'll watch this and then go. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 uh, sort of up in the duct, so very nice. So again, the purpose is just to reduce the size so that they will flush out. And you like using this kind of tapping method rather than just blasting it for prolonged periods of time. That's like. Huh? Uh, say again, I'm sorry? This is a, a kind of a tapping method. Yes. Yes, so rather than a, a just high energy, uh, yeah, but just a single uh, tap rather yeah, than the machine gun approach is what I prefer. <laughs> That's a good way of describing it. Thank you so much, Dr. Hawes. Okay. We're now going to Dr. V. Good luck with V. Thank you. <laughs> good luck with your stones. All right, so I'm now uh, going to place a luminoposing stent. I just want to give you a quick review of the anatomy. So here you see the plastic pancreatic stent. So this is a good place to start the examination of the pancreas. You, you always need to know that in 1.2% of the time, pancreatic fluid collections happen secondary to pancreatic cancer. Therefore, you have to do a complete exam uh, before, a, uh, before a stent is placed because management changes completely. So I come to the papilla. I see the iota and the IVC. I go up on my up knob and I gradually tuck the scope clockwise. And when I do that, I will bring the ventral analaga to view. And that is the ventral analaga of the pancreas. I'm going to pull back. And as you saw, we had a near normal pancreatogram. The advantage of EUS is that we can see outside the ductal structures, which otherwise cannot be visualized by uh, ERCP. So we already see some sort of changes, but as you know, the ventral analaga is not a right space to look for features of chronic pancreatitis. So I'm going to just gradually talk my score, and I'm going to pull back. You go back and forth. This is all the pancreas. All this is pancreas. Now 
I am passed uh, the duodenal bulb into the neck of the uh, into the neck of the pancreas. I'm going to re retract back. That is the portal vein that you can see, and superior to that is going to be pancreatic parenchyma. I can magnify the screen a little bit. You see some strands. You see a hyperechoic pancreatic duct that comes back and forth. So the pancreas is fairly well preserved. You can see some lobulations there, and the and the processor being used here is a Hitachi processor, and the endoscope I am using is from Pentax. Uh, it's a EG thirty eight J J T uh, echoscope. As I slowly pull back, I see a oh, fluid wow. collection in the tail of the nice. pancreas. This measures approximately six by five centimeters. There is a debris within this uh, uh, collection, but it is not a necrotic material. It is not uniformly anechoic like what you will see with a pancreatic cyst. It has minimal debris, very consistent with sonographic findings of chronic pancreatitis. So I am now going to place a 15 millimeter by 10 millimeter luminoposing metal stent. I will always place 25 millimeters if the patient has got if the patient has got uh, a vault of necrosis because there is a need for necrosectomy. So, but in this particular case, it's a pseudo cyst and there is absolutely no debris. I'm very comfortable with that 15 millimeter because I think there is less risk of delayed bleeding. The second thing you do when you place a stent is always go endoscopically and you look in the stomach. Make sure you are not in the gastric cardia. If you are on the gastric cardia and this patient develops infection, it is so difficult to, to do any necrosectomy or even, even placing a plastic within a metal stem. So I am somewhere in the body, which is 55. I can see this collection from the G junction right here, wow. but I don't want to do that. Yeah. I should go deeper in and always place the stent somewhere in the body of the stomach so that should you need an intervention, it's easy. The second thing, uh, you know where the stent is going to come out, always exit uh, the the, inter, the electrocautery catheter so that you can just see only the tip so that you're not hung up on any part of the GI tract and you can see it well. Now having done that, the third thing is to find a good position. This is a good position at about 55 centimeters. You use your color flow Doppler, make sure there is no intervening vasculature. Now Gene has affixed uh, the cautery device on it. So I'm good to go. So I'm going to now unlock the device exit the device once more check it again uh, and and confirm that there is no vasculature i think that is only a flow i don't think there is a vessel there but i'm going to recheck it and that's pretty good i'm going to switch off the color flow and i'm going to apply cautery and place the stent so the generator we are using in this particular case is a steris generator so i'm deep inside i'm going to lock it release a saf safety valve and deploy the first flange, which is the distal flange, into the pancreatic fluid collection. Perfect. Having done that, I'm going to pull it back towards me, lock it. And sometimes I like to see this endoscopically, and I look for the black mark on endoscopic view. So I'm pulling my scope back a little bit, and there is the black mark. I lock the hub again, and I'm going to deploy the distal flange. Once that is done, I'm going to unlock, push it out, and you can see clear straw colored fluid coming Perfect. out. It's very important to know, very important to know that deployment of axios is only the first step in the management of a pancreatic fluid collection. This procedure should not be completed without irrigating the fluid collection. So whether the collection has got the straw colored fluid or necrotic fluid, I always make it a point to use what I call the tandem cannula or the ERCP cannula. And I put the cannula in the biopsy port. I identify the stent. And then what I would do is I will irrigate it with normal saline until uh, I get a very clear return of fluid. And what it does is it decreases stent dysfunction. So therefore, uh, never complete this procedure uh, without adequate irrigation of the cyst cavity. And this is particularly relevant for patients with walled up necrosis or acute necrotic collections because a necrotic material will clog the stent. So you come out. Do you I don't... routinely send a fluid for any gram stain or culture? I always do. Energy? So we have already aspirated some fluid as you can see oh, and fantastic. that will go for gram stain culture. I can pretty much assure you that this is probably going to be a negative uh, because of the history that this patient, that this looks more like not an infective collection but just an inflammatory collection. Now I'm going to just irrigate this. And you can see water 
going in and I'm usually very patient with this process. I'll be here for about three to four minutes. And my end point is that the consistency of the fluid that I put in should be the same as one coming out. So you can see the axial stent in and uh, on EUS view. And if you look very carefully, you can see how well the cavity is getting irrigated. And you need to continuously do this until this collection becomes purely anechoic with absolutely no debris. And it's worth every second of this procedure because this will make the patient feel much better, decrease the chances for reinfection and minimize the possibility of a stent dysfunction due to debris clogging the lumen of the stent. And uh, traditional protocol, the patient will come back to see me in three weeks and at that time I will just use a rat to forceps and take it out. Do you Usually, um, yeah. have repeat imaging, Dr. Varadar? Yes, we will uh, repeat uh, yeah, cross-sectional imaging. Even a CT without contrast is okay if it is only a pseudocyst. Okay. And you can see how clear the collection is. Oh, that's so, beautiful. I think uh, nice. this will be my uh, the end of this uh, procedure, uh, Dr. Bang. So, the learning, so I just want to summarize to you uh, the importance of fluoroscopy. As you can see, fluoroscopy is important so that you can navigate the ducts very carefully. When you're doing a pancreatic duct, you know exactly what you're doing. This is not only important for the procedure, but it's important for the patient because we decrease the possibility of adverse events due to blind navigation that can cause duct puncture and leaks. The second is the, the versatility of the system. You're able to image the tail of the pancreas, the branch ducts, the intrahepatic radicals and so forth so easily using a good fluoroscopy system. The third is the ability to navigate it uh, in either way of the patient. And most importantly, uh, radiation exposure is a big problem. And the box that you've been seeing has been programmed in a way that radiation exposure is minimized by 84%. And therefore, it's very safe for both patients and providers uh, um, because radiation is not benign. That's always a problem with it. So with that, I'm going to conclude my case. And I hope you enjoyed this uh, uh, particular case and procedure with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. V. So to conclude, uh, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today for this uh, webinar on fluoroscopy and interventional endoscopy procedures. And just a reminder that we have Florida Live Endoscopy uh, from August 18th to 20th. Um, so less than three weeks from now, uh, basically, it's going to be an amazing event in person with the most fantastic faculty. Um, and 40 interventional procedures. Um, and so I hope really um, hope you enjoyed the uh, webinar today. We look forward to seeing you next month. And um, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Um, you can play the video now, Stephen. Thank you.